This is the medical legal chapter, chapter three. Now, when it comes to um, legal stuff, what I've um, experienced in the field is uh, this plays a big role in what we do, how we do it. Uh, and when I'm on a call, I'm constantly trying to understand uh how the legal aspects of what I'm allowed to do and how I do it play into the patient care. So it's going to be on your mind a lot as you're going through your assessment and treatment process because of the liability and because of the rights of the patients have to be upheld. Well, let's talk about some, some definitions. So the first definition that you should be aware of is called scope of practice. And these are your protocols. Remember, protocols are the written rules that we need to follow when we assess and treat patients. If you go into the County of San Diego protocol book that you guys purchased, um, again, the, the yellow uh, area, the blue area, uh, those are the adult and pediatric protocols. Those are all written by your county medical director and approved. If you were to have the original copies, you'd notice at the bottom of those copies, uh, she has signed all of those. So those are official protocols that you follow. So based on state of California uh, criteria and the county of San Diego criteria, um, that defines your scope of practice. Now, standard of care is a little more uh, gray area. So standard of care usually comes into play when your care is questioned. So you go into a court of law and what they used to do was they would uh, find an equally trained and equally experienced EMT. Uh, they would um, tell them the, the conditions and situations of the call in question and that that peer, that other EMT, would say yes or no you followed the correct procedures and you re you remained at, at a minimum standard of care. If they say no, that you fell below that standard of care, you could be then found liable uh, for whatever transpired. Now there's a, a term called duty to act. And it's kind of misunderstood. Uh, in the state of California, if you read the uh, title, uh, I think it's Title 22 regulations, uh, you only have a duty to act when you're on duty. When you're, whether you're a volunteer or whether you're a paid or a firefighter or EMT, if you are a pre-hospital care provider and you're on duty, uh, you have a duty to act. But it's not just responding to the call. It's being prepared to respond to that call. It's making sure that you have all your equipment. For instance, you, you get on duty at 7 o'clock in the morning, and then rather than checking out your ambulance or fire truck, you decide to go to Starbucks and get a $12 latte. Well, let's say you're at, you're at Starbucks and you're getting your, your latte or your espresso or whatever, and you get a call, and you and then you respond to that call, but because you did not check out your rig, you didn't you did not realize that there was no batteries in the AED, and you arrive on scene. This person's in cardiac arrest. Your AED is non-functional because of the fact that you didn't check out your rig. That is a failure in your duty to act as a professional EMT. So all of these kind of play a role. Um, it's kind of a, an overall type of thing where we have this duty to respond, to act. And this, this is officially, it's like state by state. Like if you were, if you lived and worked in Arizona, if you were licensed in the state of Arizona as an EMT, Arizona says that even off duty, if you're driving home from work in your private vehicle and you, you come upon a traffic accident or someone who's been injured, 
in the state of California, in the state of Arizona anyway, you have to stop and render care until someone of equal or higher authority uh, relieves you of that duty. In California, it says that we only have this duty to act when we're on duty, but, but here's the problem. Um, the definition of on duty, they, they don't really define it very, very, uh, very clearly. So the problem that we run into with all this, with this duty to act, well, like I said, in the, in the state of California, you, you technically, according to how it's written in the state regulations, you, you only have to respond when you're on duty. The problem with this is public perception. What is the definition of being on duty? It doesn't clearly define it in the state regs. Now, let's say you're driving home from work. You just got off shift. You clocked out. You're not on duty. Technically, you're not being paid, but you're still in uniform. And you stop at 7-Eleven to pick up a six-pack of beer or whatever, and someone trips and falls and hits their head uh, right there on the sidewalk. So technically, you're not on duty. So the question is, do you have a duty to act? And the answer is yes. So anytime that you can be perceived as a medical professional by the public, you're in uniform, it says EMT on your uniform, uh, and something happens in front of you, you have a duty to act. Uh, about five years ago, there was a case in Northern California where a firefighter paramedic was driving in his own pickup truck um, somewhere, and he came upon a traffic accident. And rather than stopping, he just kind of rolled through with the rest of the traffic, just kind of took a look and rolled through um, because he had this perception that I'm not on duty. It's the state of California. I don't have to stop. Well, one of the injured parties, a, a lady, um, she is fairly seriously injured. She wound up being paralyzed from the waist down, as I recall. And there was a bystander at scene who saw this pickup truck driving through or through the area, driving down past the scene, and noticed that on the back of this pickup truck was a bunch of firefighter-related stickers. I'm a firefighter, I'm a paramedic, I save lives, whatever it might have said, it identified the person in that truck as potentially being a, a medical professional. And so the bystander uh, wrote down the license of the vehicle, gave it to the lawyer, and of the injured woman, and they sued this gentleman, this firefighter. It did go to court. Uh, ultimately, it was thrown out of court, but the, um, the firefighter still had to hire a lawyer and go through the whole process. So anytime you have anything on that identifies you as an EMT, uh, you have a duty to act because you, you're providing that public perception. And this is why normally when I work, I, I go to work in my civilian clothes, I change my uniform, and then when I you know, go home, I go back into my civilian clothes. And on my car in particular, I don't have any stickers. I don't have any identification on my car. It's not that I'm not proud of what I do. It's just such a high liability for me to respond when I'm off duty, both from a legal perspective and also from a safety perspective. I, I don't really carry uh, EMT equipment in my car. I don't carry gloves and glasses and those kinds of things and bandages and all that. I, I, I don't think it's appropriate anyway. So what, if I stop and I have no safety glasses or no, or I don't have any gloves to put on, I'm endangering myself. So it's just going to be your call. This is purely a kind of a gray area, like I said. And you'll have to decide. But if you're in uniform, you can be identified in some way as an EMT or a paramedic or a firefighter, and you don't stop and render care, uh, potentially someone could call you out on it. Now, I'm sure when you guys went through your CPR class, when you got your BLS CPR card, they might have mentioned the Good Sam laws. Uh, these were enacted back in the early 60s, and they were initially uh, meant 
so that physicians could stop and render care. And as long as the physicians did the best they could and stayed within their scope of practice, even if the, the person they're rendering care to actually winds up dying, they could not be held uh, liable for that. This also applies to EMTs and to paramedics and to nurses as well. The problem with all this is, is even if you do exactly what you're supposed to do and, 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 and you stay within your scope of practice, you can still be sued. So it doesn't prevent you from having to go to court. It just might prevent you from getting to, to lose in the court of law. Just remember that if you do stop and render care to someone uh, while you're off duty, you do have to remain at scene until you're relieved by someone of equal or higher authority who is, is on duty. Um, and, uh, and also you need to remain in your scope of practice. If you do something outside your scope of practice or if you perform a skill or an assessment that's inappropriate, or incorrect, uh, then of course this law will not protect you. Now there's other legal protections. Uh, some of these might sound familiar. We'll go through these. The first one's uh, called sovereign immunity. And um, sovereign immunity, what it basically means is, is if, if you are a municipality or uh, a public agency like a fire department, uh, like the military, uh, like a police department, there is this um, ongoing idea that if you're a public service agency uh, working for a government, uh, you have uh, immunity from, uh, from lawsuits. Well, this has been disproven over and over again. Uh, you, at least in the state of California anyway, I don't know if you guys have ever, ever gone to, uh, not that this all directly pertains, but if you ever gone to a, uh, some type of um, go-kart track or you did something, you, uh, you rented a bicycle or you rented a motorcycle or you rented a car and you sign a, a, a release of liability a waiver, even ice skating, you go ice skating, you sign a waiver saying, I, if I fall down and die, I'm not going to sue the ice rink. Well, the problem with this in the state of California is, is you can, cannot legally sign away your, your rights. So even though you sign that waiver of liability, if you can prove negligence on the part of the operator, you can still sue them and win. Same thing with a public agency. If, you, if a fire department comes to your house and does something really stupid and causes gross property damage or, 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 or death, uh, and you can prove that they were negligent in some way, there's no sovereign immunity for that department or that agency. You can still sue them, and they can be still found guilty. Um, all you felons out there, I'm sure you are aware of what's called statute of limitations. So if you do something 10 years ago, uh, maybe by this time, they because it's gone through this period of time, you're no longer able to be prosecuted for that. And the last one here is, is called contributory negligence. And this is the case of, uh, I'll give you for instance, you go to a gentleman has a traffic accident. He crashes his car. And you go to the scene, and he's standing there talking on a cell phone, walking around, holding his neck. So you, you make contact with the patient. You put him in spinal motion restriction. You put a collar on his neck, and he's got, a, he's got a neck injury. And you transport him to the hospital. And now, after all this, now he's paralyzed. And he's suing you because he says that you didn't properly perform your skills. And due to the fact that you didn't do your skills correctly, he is now paralyzed. But you could say in the court of law, well, after the accident, he got himself out of his own car. He was walking around. He was talking on his cell phone. And he at least partially or mostly contributed to his, his permanent paralysis. And that might be able to uh, defray some or all of the liability away from you and your company.
Now, medical direction. Like I mentioned um, before, we, uh, we follow medical direction. This is the like standing orders, the protocols. But uh, there's, we have layers and layers and layers of medical direction. Now, the state of California has a medical director, a physician who's in charge of the state EMS program, the entire state. Uh, our county has a medical director that oversees and writes the county protocols, which you follow. There's also base hospital physicians. These are, these are doctors, and they're at certain hospitals. And I'll, you guys will learn about which hospitals are base hospitals and all that. And they can give you medical direction. So when you're out in the field uh, on a call and you call the base hospital, you're operating under that physician's license that you're talking to on the radio, essentially. When you're performing standing orders, remember, standing orders are things that we can do without having to make contact and ask permission. We already have written permission. You're following the county medical director's uh, rule. So you're under her, and uh, her name's Christy. If you want to know, that's her first name anyway, Christy. Uh, uh, you're under her licensure when you're using standing orders. So you're always under some medical direction, whether it's through a base hospital or whether it's through the county medical, medical director's licensure, you're operating under the licensure of a physician. Uh, pretty much every agency has to have their own medical director. So for instance, San Diego Fire has a physician that oversees all of their EMS. Uh, AMR has a physician that oversees all of their AMS uh, programs and policies. So there's layer upon layer upon layer of, of uh, medical direction. So just to remind you, standing orders, again, are those that are pre-written that you've memorized. And you can perform those skills and provide those medications without, without having to call the hospital to get permission. Base hospitals, uh, they're the only hospitals that can uh, give you direction over the radio. We have uh, base hospitals and we have what's called basic emergency facilities. Like I'll give you, a, for instance, uh, Kaiser Permanente, Kaiser Zion. Those are basic emergency facilities. They do have radios. You can contact them by radio. and But all you're really doing is you're saying hi, this is BLS 25. We have a mild status patient and we'll be inside to your facility in 10 minutes. It, it's a courtesy call. If you were to ask them questions, they cannot give you any direction or they cannot give you any, any type of orders. If you have questions about the patient's care, if you need orders from a physician, if, you, uh, if you're trying to work out some type of complicated issue, legal, medical, legal issue, you need to call a base hospital and talk to a base hospital physician. They're the only ones in the county who you can talk to directly. They can give you orders and you can follow them. And then if you do follow those orders over the radio, that's an online medical direction. Now, if you think about what we do as EMTs in, in whatever capacity you're in, whether you're a lifeguard or whether you're a firefighter or border patrol or whatever you plan to be doing, we're interacting with people who are sick or injured. And it could be the worst day of their lives. They could be disoriented. They could be unconscious. They could be intoxicated under the influence of drugs or alcohol. They could be having strokes, all kinds of things you're going to encounter out there. And so these, these people you encounter, they're very vulnerable. They're very, they're in the state uh, where they're easily manipulated and easily uh, abused, either physically, financially, or even sexually sometimes. So we have this, these, these ethical responsibilities to work at a higher standard and and when we go out in the field to work and we treat these patients, uh, we have to think that we're, we're in charge of this person's life right now. We have access to all of whatever's around them, their private residence, their money, their clothing, their jewelry, 
their credit cards, their lives themselves, and we need to uh, protect everything that's that that's around this person. So when it when it when so when it really comes down to ethics and morals, what what I have noticed and what I really truly believe in is, with the exception of a couple of sociopathic people out there, uh, the average person they know when they're doing wrong. They have that feeling. They they do something. They steal gum from the store, or they don't pay a bill, or something like that. And and even though they they feel like they've accomplished something, they've gotten something over on someone, you feel weird. You have this kind of weird feeling. And 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 that's really your best your your best indication something's not right. So if you do something and it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. And it probably isn't ethical, uh, whatever you're doing. So I would you know reverse the process or Think about it twice before you do it. You guys get the idea. Now, issues of patient consent and refusal. So if a patient is awake and alert and they're oriented and they have the capacity to understand their problem or condition, whatever's going on today, they have a right to refuse any or all of your treatment or transport. They can say, yes, I want to go to the hospital, but I don't want you to touch me. Or they could say, you can treat me, but I don't want to go to the hospital. They have a right to refuse any or all of this. The problem with all this is, is before you even consider consent and refusal, you have to make the determination as an EMT, is this person in front of you a patient? So my question is, is just from common sense, if you think about it, and I want you to think about it for a couple of seconds, how do you know this person in front of you is a patient? You, you, could, you could walk up to anybody and go, hi, I'm an EMT, I'm here to help you. So what makes a, a person a patient? Well, you can think about it. You, you might have called 911 yourself at some point, or your family member might have done it. Uh, you probably have a problem. So you called 911 because you have a problem or a concern. Uh, or maybe someone else called for you because you were incapacitated to call. Maybe you had an altered mental status. Uh, so if this person called 911, they're a patient. They have a problem. If they're confused or disoriented, they're automatically a patient. Uh, if they ask you for help, they're automatically a patient. So for the County of San Diego, I have a list here. Of, of the definition of a patient. So per the County of San Diego, and this is pretty much across the board if you, it probably follows your textbook pretty closely, but anyone who has a chief complaint, so this is the person, they call and say, oh, I have chest pain, I have back pain, I don't feel good today, I'm dizzy, I stubbed my toe. They have a reason for calling and they called Nine, well, they've accessed, nine, accessed 911. Also, if you suspect they might have an injury or illness. Um, I went on a call years ago where a gentleman drove his car over and down an embankment and wound up at the bottom of this ravine. And when I got there finally, he had gotten out of his car, he had crawled up the side of this embankment, and he was standing on the side of the road talking on his cell phone was calling his wife or something. And I get there, and other than being a little dirty from climbing up the embankment, he didn't have a scratch on him. He was completely asymptomatic. I asked him, sir, are you okay? What happened? He says, I swerved to avoid a, I think it was a deer or a bunny rabbit or something. I don't remember which one it was. And he swerved off the road and down this embankment. And I said, are you hurt? And he says, no, I'm fine. I don't want to go to the hospital. So at that point, if, if, if he says, I'm fine, and you just walk away, okay, thank you, sir, have a nice day, you've just walked away from a patient. Because thinking about the mechanism of injury, thinking about the fact that he's, he swerved off the road and went down an embankment and wound up in a ditch, uh, that's a fairly serious amount of energy and 
and potential force and potential injury. So why does he not have any pain right now? Well, a couple of reasons. One, more than likely, he's pretty jacked up on adrenaline. Remember that adrenaline stuff? Uh, he's probably really nervous. He's really jacked up on adrenaline. He's probably pretty numb by the numbed by the whole event. And trust me, within a couple of minutes, as the adrenaline starts to wear off, as his heart rate goes down and as his breathing starts to get back to normal, he's going to start feeling aches and pains. Uh, also, just 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 based on the mechanism of injury, just based on the fact of what happened to him, you automatically have to make this person a patient. So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna say I I understand, sir, that you're not uh, hurt anywhere right now, but do you mind if I check you out just in case you could have injuries that you might not be aware of? You proceed to go through your complete primary and secondary assessment, and you get their vital signs, their blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and even after all of that, he can still say, No, I don't want to go to the hospital. Well, that's fine. You've done a full assessment. You've documented that assessment on, on your paperwork. He has signed the document. You have signed the document. Then you leave, and he dies an hour later. You're covered. If you just walk away from this person who's been in this traumatic event crashing his car, and you don't do any documentation or any assessment, that's a gigantic liability for you. Uh, and it's also bad for the patient because you might have caught something that could have saved his life. Now, if the person is not oriented to person, place, time, or event, they're disoriented, they're confused, they're unconscious, uh, they're slow to respond, they're automatically patients. Um, let's say you have a person who is an Alzheimer's patient, and Alzheimer's affects the brain, it causes disorientation and confusion. Uh, people who have, who have later stage Alzheimer's they don't know where they are. They don't know what year it is. They, they, they couldn't tell you the name of their loved one. Uh, sometimes they even forget their own names. So what I'm getting at with all this is, is that let's say there's a, uh, an Alzheimer's or dementia patient uh, who somehow escapes from an Alzheimer's facility and they're wandering around. They're not injured. They're not sick. But you arrive on scene, this person is acting confused, even though they, they don't have any new injuries and they don't have any new medical conditions, they're still patients because they're disoriented, they're confused. Um, requires or requests field treatment or transport. Anytime someone says to you, I need help, they're automatically patients. So I've had situations where people have walked up to the ambulance or walked to the fire station, knocked on the door and said, I want to go to the hospital. And of course, the, my first question is, is, well, why? What's going on today? And they've said to me, oh, I, I don't want to tell you. So are they patients? Well, yes, they don't have to tell you. I've had patients say to me, I'm not going to tell you what's going on. Uh, I don't want you to talk to me. I, I don't want you to touch me. I just want to go to the hospital. And you put them on the gurney and you drive, drive them to the hospital and you, in your narrative, as you're writing your, your medical report, you're just going to make these objective statements about what this person said and why they didn't want to be touched if they do give you an answer to that. So even though they, they're not fully cooperative with you uh, in that sense of a, an assessment, they're still patients. You still need to transport them to the hospital. I mean, why argue with them, right? So you just, you just no problem, sir. Let's get on the gurney. Let's go to the hospital. They're on the gurney. They're going to the hospital. Uh, let the doctor deal with it. You can, you can sit there in the back of the ambulance and do your documentation and twiddle your thumbs or whatever you want to do. And it's, it's the best thing for you because it covers your butt. And it's the best thing for the patient because they get what they want. And on top of all that, they get billed for the drive to the hospital. So your company gets the money as well. So it's a win-win for everybody. Now, minors. Um, minor, the definition of a minor is uh, any patient who is under 18 years of age. 
Now, this is different than a pediatric. Remember, a pediatric is uh, anyone under 15 years of age, and that is for um, uh, taking him to children's hospital and medications. So if you're going to give a medication to a, to a, to a, to a pediatric, uh, then there's different dosing than it would be for an adult. If you have a, a pediatric trauma patient, they would go to children's. But a minor is anyone who's under 18 years of age. Um, there are emancipated minors. These are people who are 17 and they're active duty military, like in the Marines. Uh, they are uh, females that are, have children. They're, they're 16, 17 years old, 15 years old, and they have a, a child. They birth a child. They have limited, limited emancipation with that. They can make their own decisions about their health care. Uh, and, of course, there's the rich kids who separate themselves legally from uh, from their parents because they're so rich and the parents aren't, and you guys get the idea. Uh, that guy in the movie, Macaulay Culkin, that guy's the screaming kid in the Home Alone movie, that's what he did. He, he, he became so rich, he just basically said, I don't want you guys to have any of my money, so he legally separated himself from his family. I have never encountered personally, an emancipated minor in my entire career. I'm sure they're out there somewhere, um, but they'd have to have some type of proof, uh, whether it's a military ID card or the baby with the birth, uh, birth certificate showing it is, it is her child, uh, or legal papers defining this, obviously. If they're under 18 and they're by themselves, there's no parent or guardian in the scene, they're automatically patients, whether they're injured or not. So um, wh calls that I've gone on, it's Friday night, it's 11 o'clock at night, there's two car loads of teenagers, they're 14 to 17 age range, and they're driving around out in the boonies somewhere, they're racing, and the one car crashes, gets, goes off the road, hits a tree. So I got four kids who are patients in the one car, but then I got the other four kids in the other car who didn't crash, but because they're there by themselves, there's no parent or guardian, I have eight patients. I have all eight kids are my patients right now, and I have to figure out what to do with them. Now, obviously, the injured kids, the four kids in the crash car have to go to the hospital. The other four kids, they're not injured. They were not involved in an accident. They're just unaccompanied. So a couple ways of handling this. One, you could be a total, you know, a total dick about it and actually have them transported uh, to the hospital in ambulances, which is a waste of an ambulance in all honesty. Um, or you could have the kids, this is what I prefer doing, if I have the time, have the kids call their parents. Everyone's got a cell phone and tell the parents to come out and pick these kids up. And so you're, you're doing what's called a transfer of custody from yourself to the parents when the parents arrive at scene. If the fire department's there with you, and you, you, a lot of times they are, or the police department's there with you, you can temporarily uh, give the kids off to the fire or police until the parents show up so that you, how you can then transport the injured people to the hospital. But you can see it gets kind of complicated. So you, when, you, when you get in, into a, some kind of situation where you got one injured kid and you've got four or five other kids there and there's no parent or guardian or chaperone, they're all yours until you somehow get rid of them somehow. Now, if there is a parent or guardian at scene then eh, eh, uh, of this minor, then the parent or guardian makes the decision about the child's health care. So you turn to the, the parent or the guardian and say, this is, these are my findings. Your child's having potentially having this condition, uh, we recommend transport to the hospital. And the parent will say, yes, I agree entirely, and they agree to transport. The child has no legal right to accept or refuse transport uh, at that time. The parents, the parents there, parents can refuse, though. So again, if, if you have a child who appears to be ill or injured and the parent doesn't want the child to go to the hospital, you would go through the same process of doing a full assessment on the child, explaining to the parent your findings and your concerns, calling the base hospital, talking to that doctor on the radio, explaining the circumstances and your findings, 
and let the doctor make the decision about whether or not the child uh, is okay to stay home. And what this does for us as EMTs is it involves our physician and it, it helps to defer some of the liability off onto them. So uh, basically I'm just now following orders. The doctor says so the child can stay home and with the parent, then I'm just following the doctor's orders. So it defrays some of them from my liability or your liability, I guess. So once you've identified this person's a patient in whatever capacity, uh, if they're oriented, means do they know their person, who they are, where they are, the time of day, week or month, what might have happened. Do they have the, the capacity to fully understand what's going on. Um, you have to gain uh, consent to treat. We'll talk about the different kinds of consent. So the, the one most commonly used is what's called expressed consent. And this is when a person, either verbally or non-verbally, gives you permission to touch them. So they're sitting on the ground. Maybe they fell off their skateboard or fell off their bicycle or they crashed their car. And as you're walking up, they wave you over or they, they, or they yell, help me, help me, or help me over here, or whatever it might be. Uh, they give you expressed consent. They nod their head, whatever it might be. So that gives you permission to touch them. Now this is, again, this is an awake alert oriented patient uh, who can refuse, but they say, no, I, I want your help. Then you do your assessment and you make a differential diagnosis of what's going on and you come up with a treatment plan. And you say to the patient, sir, I see you fell off your skateboard and you broke your wrist. What I'd like, you to, like, I'd like to do for you today is I'd like to splint and ice and elevate your wrist it's going to hurt a little bit when I do it, but once we get it splinted, it should feel better. Do you agree to the treatment plan? And if he says yes, as a matter of fact, I, I want you to do that, you have, now, you have now received what's called informed consent. So this really only applies, again, as a reminder, this only applies to awake and alert and oriented patients who can refuse or accept treatment. If people are unconscious, they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol, they're disoriented, confused, uh, then we go by what's called implied consent. So implied consent literally means that. What, how, it, how it's worded is, if this person were awake and alert and oriented, they would want me to help them. So it's implied that they would want my help. So if this is a, 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 a child who's not accompanied by a parent, uh, a person who's unconscious, a person who is severely intoxicated or under, under some types of, uh, some kind of drug, uh, under influence of some type of drug, these people get treated by implied consent. Now there's also an offshoot of that and it's called involuntary consent. And this is a usually, uh, it's, it's very similar to implied consent. The difference is, is, is usually you have law enforcement involved in the process. So say, for instance, you go on a call, and these are, I go on these calls frequently, and I go on these calls where uh, the police uh, arrest somebody for something, some felony, uh, felony warrants, whatever it might be. And maybe in the process of the arrest, there's a little bit of a scuffle and the patient gets, gets injured in some way. And so we arrive on scene and the patient's in handcuffs, maybe in the back of the squad car. And my first question to the officer when I get there is, is the patient in custody or are they uh, being detained? So in both cases, they'll be handcuffed. The difference is, is a big legal difference. If you're in custody, you have no right to refuse treatment or transport. The police officer makes those decisions for you, uh, usually in consultation with the medical people, the EMTs or the paramedics. If you're just detained, you're not actually in custody, then you still 
and and this is assuming you're you're awake and alert and oriented and and have the ability to refuse, uh, you can you can you can accept or refuse treatment and transport if you're if you're basically just being detained. Once you're in custody, you're uh, you're ba you're basically ha your rights are gone in that, in that respect. This also applies to people like Alzheimer's patients and Down syndrome people and people that are are, uh, are in conservatorships and there's someone that watches over them, watches out for them. These uh, in, in, these, these people are they're, they're they're just incompetent due to some kind of brain injury or organic brain syndrome or something like that, and they're always like this. And someone speaks for them, uh, and so if that person who speaks for these people aren't there then they automatically become uh, this involuntary consent and we transport them to the hospital uh, just for their own safety. So once we've determined through our assessment this person is oriented to person, place, time, and event and they don't want to be transported to the hospital or they're refusing treatment. We have to determine whether or not they have the capacity uh, to understand what's going on today and that they fully understand the risks and complications of not obtaining the treatment or not being transported to the hospital or both. So these forms, these are against medical advice forms. And uh, nowadays, everything's on the computer. We have iPads and we have tablets and computers. So it's all in the cloud and it's all forms you fill out on the computer and they sign those forms. But ultimately, there's two basic types of, of, of these release forms. The first one is the AMA. This is against medical advice, and it just basically means that. You feel that if this person does not go to the hospital immediately with you, uh, that they could be seriously injured or they could die or get sicker or whatever it might be. These are the people, these are the high-risk people. This is the elderly person who's fallen. This is the little baby with a high fever. Um, this is the person with, with abnormal vital signs who have some type of uh, uh, abnormal medical problems. Uh, they have high risk. Maybe they have uh, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, and you're thinking they might be having a stroke. These are high risk people. You need to call the base hospital, talk to the physician on the radio, and explain your findings and get their okay to have them sign out AMA. You've already done your full assessment. You have your vital signs done, your blood pressure, pulse, and respirations done. Uh, you've talked to the patient about the risks and complications of not going to the hospital. You've come to the conclusion the person has the capacity to understand his or her condition and that they understand the risks and complications and that they could die today. Uh, and then they sign the AMA and then it helps release you of liability. Now, the other form of this is called a release. And this is all on the same, basically on the same page. You click one or the other. A release is more like an agreement between you and the patient. Um, let's say you go down to Pacific Beach to the boardwalk and there's this, a guy skateboarding and he falls off a skateboard and he uh, breaks his, his finger or he scrapes his knees, or whatever it might be, some really minor, minor injury. And you get there, and he's completely alert and oriented. He's not under the influence of drugs or alcohol. He did not lose consciousness. He has no abnormal vital signs. He has no significant medical history. And all he wants you to do is bandage up his knees, splint his finger, and be on his way. This is a release. You, you don't have to call the base hospital he signs the document, you sign the document, and what the document says is that you and he both agree that his injuries today are not significant enough to be transported by an ambulance, and then the patient will find their own medical care elsewhere. And then, of course, in there it also says that the 
patient's been told of risks and complications and the fact that he can call recall 911 if he thinks later on he needs to. Now again, now, now again, remember the patient must be lucid, means for oriented person, place, time, and event. Uh, they have to understand what you're saying to them. Uh, and they have to be able to express to you, uh, back to you essentially, your concerns and their understanding of your concerns. This is just one of the many types of forms here. Again, we don't use paper forms anymore. The state of California has basically mandated them out. Everything now is uh, done online with some type of program. Now, these AMAs, these releases, they're they're high they're high uh, liability for us and our departments. Um, I I spoke to there, there's a lawyer and he's in charge of the San Diego Fire's um, law stuff. He's the one who goes to court when San Diego Fire gets sued, and uh, and he said the number one reason for for liability against the department are are these AMAs are these releases. Either a couple of things happens. Uh, one, the first responders or the the ambulance service, whoever it might be, they never filled one out. They never did one when they should have. Uh, the person uh, says that he didn't sign it, that or that the EMTs forced him to sign it, or there was an, an improper assessment done and it wasn't documented well enough. So for some reason, the AMA, the release of liability, all that stuff wasn't done um, correctly. And um, these go to court. The worst case scenario is if there's literally no documentation done. There was a case a couple of years ago where um, this lady fell out of bed. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning. She's elderly. She's probably 80 years old, and she has to pee. And so she gets up and she goes, gets out of bed, and she falls in the process of walking or getting to the bathroom. And so she calls 911. The fire department gets there and they say, Are you hurt? And she says, No. And they said, What would you like us to do? And she said, I just want to go back into bed. So they helped her back into bed and they left. They did not do any assessment. They did not check her vital signs. They did not ask her any questions. They just basically put her back into bed left. Her daughter came by the next morning to say hi, and the woman was dead. So the daughter calls 911. My, my mom's not responding to me. The same fire crew shows up and, and tells the daughter, hey, we were here. We were just here last night. We picked her up out, off the floor. Well, you can only imagine the daughter then said, well, if you had transported my, my mother last night, she'd be alive today. And they had no documentation. They had nothing written. They had no vital signs. They had nothing on this on this person. So it's really important that you spend that five or 10 minutes doing this documentation. Five minutes of documentation and five minutes of assessment on a patient like this can save you five months in a court of law. So if you get lazy, uh, this is when you're going to get hurt. And this is when your agency is going to get hurt as well. Now, what I, what I do and what you should do as well is you should offer a person a ride to the hospital at least a couple of times, not just once. Sir, uh, would you like to go to the hospital? No, I don't want to go. Talk to them. Ask them why. As you're doing this, you're getting their vital signs. You're doing your assessment. You get done with your assessment, and then you say, well, sir, I really think you should go to the hospital today. Why don't you come with me? And he says no again. Uh, then you can then say, the patients refuse transport multiple times. I, I personally, I, I asked three times. That's my, that's my, that's my gig. That's what I do. 
And so I can document that I've asked this person three times and all three times he, he or she has said no. And uh, I've determined that they have the capacity uh, to, uh, to refuse. And if I have any information, if I have any concerns, I'm going to get my doctor involved in the process. And then I want to explain to them clearly that they have a right to call back 911. And I need to tell them, and, and, and I'm not being over dramatic about this. You have to actually say it. It's county protocol. Sir, do you understand if you don't go to the hospital today, you could uh, be seriously injured or you could die today? Do you understand? And they say, yes, that's what we want to hear. And also that they can recall 911. Now, advanced directives. Um, some of you might be aware of these. Uh, this is the do not resuscitate order. This is the person, uh, usually people that um, are terminally ill. They're in hospice, uh, hospice, some type of hospice care for their illness. They're going to die in the next six or eight months. And they're required to fill out a form that says, if my heart stops or if I stop breathing, just let me die. Don't do anything for me. It's called a DNR, Do Not Resuscitate Order. Now, the simplest form of this is the DNR. It's, it's a, I'll show you the form here in a couple of seconds, but it's really, it's one page. It has a patient's name on it. It has their signature. It has the doctor's name, the doctor's signature. It's dated, and they just essentially fill this out, and it, it's very simple. It says, I... John, do not want anything done to me if my heart stops or if I stop breathing. And this can be in a paper form. It can be an electronic document. Uh, it can be a bracelet, an embossed bracelet. People that are in hospice, what will happen is they'll sign one of these documents at the hospice hospital, and then the hospital will produce these embossed uh, bracelets or necklaces and on the front it says DNR and the back it has the person's name and their, their information so it's, it's given to them it's 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 an official DNR and it doesn't have to be the original document it can be a copy that's also acceptable just remember look at it carefully and make sure it's properly filled out properly signed and dated otherwise it's not valid the other thing we encounter, which is pretty rare, are living wills. These people have either a lot of money or property, and every year they go to their lawyer and they rewrite their living will. And in that will, they in that will, of course, is where the money is going to go and where the property is going to go and all that. But in that will is also their medical requirements. And usually, what they'll do is they'll um, they'll name a person as their uh, dead designated decision maker if they become incapacitated. So they give this person what's called power of attorney to speak for them if they become unconscious or unable to speak for themselves. So again, pretty rare uh, uh, out in the field, but you might encounter it. Again, they, they'll have this documentation. Either, 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 either the person who has the power of attorney will have that or you'll have the, the living will present. Uh, the other one that we encounter probably most commonly is now called a PULST. This is the, the Physician Order of Life-Sustaining Treatment. And um, this is this is kind of problematic for a couple of reasons, and I'll, I'll show you what, the, what it looks like here in a couple of seconds. But uh, the PULST is technically not a DNR. According to the state of California, the PULST is not an official DNR. But the state has said that we can honor it as one in lieu of the presence of a DNR. It's kind of a weird legal stuff. The problem with the, the pulsed is the patient has choices. They can say, yes, I want everything. Uh, yes, I want something or I want nothing. So they, they have a, they have, it's almost like a, a menu at a Chinese restaurant. They can, they can pick from, you know, from the different sections and get what they want. So this, these pulse, you really have to have to read them carefully. Um, don't just automatically accept when you see one of these that, that it actually is a DNR because they could have checkboxed, I want everything. And if you missed that and you automatically assumed it was a DNR and you did not start CPR, you would be liable for that. 
There's another aspect of this which is coming into play. This just happened um, uh, a few weeks ago. And there's this, the law, this is law that we have in the California now. It's called AB 215. This is the End of Life Option Act. It's been in, it's, I think it was it voted in about three or four years ago. It's, it's a really simple law. It's a really good law. The problem is, is it's, it doesn't, it, in the law itself, anywhere in the law itself, it says nothing about having a DNR. So this just happened a few weeks ago. We've had about um, three or four of these people. So this, this is the person who has been told they're going to die. They have terminal cancer, and the doctor says, you're going to die in agony over the next six months. And this person goes, well, I don't want to do that. So they go through these various legal and medical loopholes, uh, I guess one of the loopholes, whatever, and they get permission to, to die. The doctor prescribes them a pill or pills, and they go home and they take this pill and they die. And, and this basically is, is like a suicide act. And, uh, and so consequently, that, that's, and I, you know, that's fine, and they have every right to do that because it's state law, and I think it's probably best for the person anyway, my personal opinion. But that being said, there's, there's nowhere in the law that says they have to have a DNR. So this, again, this just happened a few weeks ago uh, out in, uh, I think it was out in Santee, where uh, this person took the, the black pill of death and she died and then the family changed their minds and they called 911 and they wanted the patient uh, resuscitated. So the fire crews got there, the ambulance crews got there, and they had this person, with the, the, the woman had the documentation saying that she had a right to die, but she would never received any kind of DNR or pulsed. So they had to start CPR on this woman, even though her, her wishes were to die. So complications sometimes. Uh, in that situation... If there's any kind of question about the the v validity of the DNR or the pulsed, or you have any questions about whether to start CPR or not, it's always best to err on the side of the patient and just start your compressions and ventilations and then call the hospital and talk to the physician on the radio and then let them make the determination about that. In this case, with this, with this, with this young woman who... Uh, who uh, had her assisted suicide, they wound up transporting the woman to the hospital doing CPR, and basic, just basic ventilations and, and compressions. And uh, the doctor at the hospital spoke to the family, and the family wound up letting the woman go, and she finally ended up uh, getting her wish. So when it comes down to, to DNRs, you need to understand that this is a state law and that we have, you have to understand like what a DNR really means, essentially. So a, a DNR is, says do not resuscitate. Now, what that means is if the patient dies of natural causes, they die from their cancer, they die from their medical condition, uh, that's expected then if they're not breathing and or they have no pulse, you would just let them pass on. That does not mean that if they fall and hurt themselves, you don't treat them. So if you have a person who has a DNR and they trip, and they trip over their chihuahua and fall and hit their head, uh, that patient has every right to treatment. Uh, so DNR doesn't mean let them die. DNR means... If this person dies of natural causes and their heart stops or their breathing stops or both, then you would just let them pass on. Uh, make sure that the DNR or the pulse or whatever they happen to have is valid, signed and dated, and present in some form. If there's any question about it, uh, if the DNR looks funky, it's not signed, you're, you're concerned about this might be not the patient's signature or something like that, uh, start just start your CPR and get the doctor involved on the uh, on the radio. But again, it does not prevent us from doing what's called palliative care, just good old pain control and bleeding control and feeding them and comfort care.
So this is the official state of California DNR form. Um, it's really simple. You, usually what happens with this form is uh, hospitals and convalescent homes and uh, hospice, what they'll do is they'll take this form, they'll take the header off of it, and they'll put their own header on top of it. So you, you're probably never going to see this official form in the field. They all work. They're all fine. But usually the hospital uh, or the uh, medical facility in question, they put their own header on it, their own address and that kind of stuff on it. It's still, it's still valid as long as it's signed and dated. Again, these are really great. Um, when I go into uh, to a house of an elderly person who has died, the first question out of my mouth to the family is, does your loved one have a DNR? Or what is your loved one's decisions about, you know, do they want us to resuscitate or not? Uh, it really helps cut corners uh, when you do that. So if they say yes, as a matter of fact, they have a DNR, then your call is over, essentially. Uh, you don't even have to start compressions on them. Now, if they can't find the DNR and they got to go in the other room and, you know, hunt for it for five minutes, I would definitely start compressions at least until they can find that uh, form. This is the post. You, uh, you'll note that it's bright pink. Uh, that's designed that way so it shows up clearly in someone's uh, medical files. Um, this is a rather problematic document for us. Uh, it's broken down into various sections. Usually section A and B are the ones we're mostly concerned with. Obviously up at the top, the person's name and their demographic information needs to be there. At the bottom, you have to have signatures from both the doctor and the, uh, and the patient, and it has to be dated just like a DNR. But there's areas in here where the patient can check box they want no CPR or they want CPR. There's other boxes that, that they can check box to say, I want everything. I want full care. I want limited care or I want no care whatsoever. So you need to read this thing uh, when you... Uh, arrive at scene. So make sure you fully understand that that, that no CPR is checkboxed and the they do not want any care checkbox and that could be honored as an as a DNR. If they say I want full CPR but I don't want any advanced care like intravenous fluids or IV medications, which is one of the options here, well, then you would just do basic life support on the patient, just compressions and ventilations. So what it really comes down to, like I said, is you've got to read this thing uh, to interpret what, what the patient's wishes are. So other legal aspects of emergency care, right? I kind of covered... Um, the subject of negligence a little bit earlier, but I'll get more in-depth into it now. I talked about negligence, uh, being found negligent. If you um, fall below your standard of care, you do something that harms the patient in some way, uh, then you can be found negligent in a court of law. So there's two general types of negligence. One is criminal negligence, and that would be something pretty much like some type of felony. You've assaulted the patient, you've purposely harmed the patient in some way, and your intent was to harm. Uh, majority of the cases that are seen in court for negligence are civil cases. Um, brought about by the patient themselves due to some type of perceived injury that they think was caused by the EMT's action or, or inaction. So for the patient to prove negligence, they have to, to prove that all four of these elements 
uh, were in place, which led to their their injury or their their problem. First, they have to prove that the EMT had a duty to act. And remember what that means. It's not just responding to the call. This is, was their equipment up to date? Were the medications they were giving expired? Uh, was the battery dead in the AED? Uh, they also have to prove that in some way uh, they breached that duty. They have to prove that the patient suffered some kind of injury or harm. And they have to connect this up and prove that the, the EMT's actions or inactions led to these injuries that the, uh, the patient's uh, suing for. There are two types of negligence. Uh, one is called simple negligence, and this is essentially just making a mistake, uh, possibly hurting the patient in some way because you drop them inadvertently by mistake. I've done that a couple of times. Uh, generally speaking, is if you have a fairly decent rapport built up with your patient, you have some kind of friendly, positive relationship with the patient and their family. Um, this never really goes any further. Uh, you apologize. They understand. It's, it's not a problem. If for some reason, due to the complexities of the call, or maybe you're having a bad day, you develop some kind of adversarial relationship with the family or, and or the patient, and now you're argumentative, and they don't like you, and then you drop the patient, this is when it's probably going to go further, uh, especially if the patient has some kind of injuries from the fall, uh, then you're going to wind up going to court. So it really does behoove you to, to be friendly to your patients, to build some kind of positive, friendly rapport with them, so that if something does happen where you make a mistake, it doesn't blow it all out of proportion. The other form of this is called gross negligence. And it's just literally that. It's it's not a mistake. It's an obvious screw up. Um, this is where a person knows they shouldn't do something, knows that it might harm the patient, but they do it anyway. And the one case that I can remember uh, happened here in San Diego, uh, San Diego County, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, two EM, to actually two paramedics, they went to a house down in San Ysidro and they had a patient who was bedridden due to some illness. And when they got there, the family asked the paramedics, please do not stand up. My mother, my mother has very fragile bones. If you stand her up, you'll break her bones. And the paramedics ignored the family. They stood the woman up. They rotated the woman, and as they turned the woman to sit her on the gurney, they shattered all the bones of her feet, and she never walked again. Well, this all went to court, obviously. Uh, the woman won a million-dollar lawsuit, um, and she deserved it. I mean, the medics were wrong. They, 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 they ignored the warnings from the family. They were, were told that if they do this, the woman could be harmed, and they did it anyway. Go figure. So abandonment. We talked a little, little bit about this um, one of the other uh, lectures, but ultimately, if let's say you're off duty and you stopped at that traffic accident uh, and you rendered care to a patient, you can't leave like we mentioned before until someone of equal or higher authority shows up and. And, uh, and takes over for you. And this person has to be on duty. So an on-duty firefighter paramedic, on-duty firefighter EMT, uh, on-duty EMT, uh, they have to come and take over your care, and then you can leave. If you don't do that, if you walk away, then obviously that's abandonment. Now, when it comes to being on duty, you can also have abandonment when you're actually on duty. So when you're on duty, there's a couple of uh, 
circumstances where you could possibly be uh, found uh, to abandon to have abandoned the patient. First one I could think of is uh, you're on the scene of an accident, you're rendering care to a patient, and uh, a bystander runs up and says, hey, someone got shot down the block. And you then abandon your patient and run down the block to render care to the shooting victim. Um, that's abandonment. Now, what you, what you should do in that situation would be to contact your dispatch, explain there's another call down the street, and it's a shooting, and then they're going to send another unit to that incident, and you stay with your patient. If you leave that scene and run down to the other incident, that's abandonment. Uh, another uh, case is, is if you go to the hospital, a lot of times we go to, to uh, the emergency room and it's really, really busy. It's really impacted. And we get there and we have to wait for a bed. And let's say you're in a hurry, you're, uh, you just take your patient, you put them on whatever bed you can find, and you walk out the door without any type of turnover. If you have not turned over to a nurse or a doctor, if you, if you have not gotten a signature, uh, that's abandonment. So make sure you get the signature uh, from a doctor or nurse. Give them a turnover before you leave the patient. Assault and battery. Um, assault is threatening to, to touch someone against their will, and battery is physically touching them. So if you encounter a patient who uh, wants to be transported but does not want you to touch them and you proceed to take a pulse or a blood pressure against their will, uh, that's battery. If you threaten them and say, if you don't get on the gurney, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to turn off your oxygen and you're going to suffocate, uh, you're threatening them with battery, uh, that's assault. And of course, this only applies if they're awake and alert and oriented and have the capacity to understand their condition. If they have an altered mental status or confused or unconscious, then this, of course, doesn't apply. False imprisonment or kidnapping. Uh, your book talks about this, where you can transport a patient uh, without their consent and it's considered to be kidnapping. It's, it's kind of hard for me to, to kind of wrap my head around this because we do this quite often in the field. Um, if we can prove a patient uh, needs to go to the hospital even though they don't agree and we feel that their life is threatened, we can still take them against their will because remember, it's all about, it's all about their capacity to understand. So even though someone has uh, an understanding of where they are and who they are and what happened today, the person, place, time, and event, maybe based on your, your assessment, you can't really prove this person has the capacity to understand not going to the hospital is dangerous. So you could say that legally this person does, doesn't have the ability to make their own decision and you would treat them under um, treat them under implied consent. You know, again, I've done this dozens of times, uh, but only when I really thought it was beneficial for the patient. So defamation of character. This can be either verbal or written. So slander is verbally defaming the patient, calling them names, uh, and somehow harming their reputation. Uh, libel is the written form of that. So maybe when you're filling out your patient documentation form, you write in there uh, something that's libelous. You say something about the person, their person's character. Um, then you could be found negligent for that. So when you're speaking on the radio, when you're speaking to the patient, 
when you're writing your documentation, you should always re remain objective and report things that are very factual and objective. If you have any personal feelings about the patient's condition or their personality or their moral uh, or, or ethical uh, manners, uh, that's something you should keep to yourself. Again, we're, we should not be judgmental in any way and we should not express this to the patient or to the doctor or in your documentation. Now, patient confidentiality. Uh, I'm sure um, a lot of you have gone to the hospitals or doctor's offices uh, with appointments, you maybe to a pharmacy, and you've probably signed uh, some type of uh, HIPAA uh, document saying you have a right to, uh, to control your own uh, your own, your own health information um, included in HIPAA, the, the HIPAA law, the Health Portability Act, is are, are other rules as well about how EMS personnel have to protect the patient's personal information, even in the field. So um, every agency has different rules that sometimes uh, supersede HIPAA, meaning they're stronger than HIPAA, uh, so you're going to follow whatever your agency's internal policies are, but they're, they're usually at, at minimum at that level of the federal standard. Um, you can, in, at times, release information uh, to law enforcement, fire, other medical personnel, depending on the circumstances. And of course, you would never speak to the press or to the public. Uh, that's not your place. Um, the problem you run into with this is uh, the uh, the news media, the press, they're very aggressive. They'll get in your face. Uh, they'll yell at you. They'll they'll try to uh, elicit some type of response from you, and you can't tell them to leave. You can't push them. You can't touch them. Uh, that would be battery on your part, and you'd wind up probably getting arrested for it, or at least yelled at. Um, so. Again, if someone asks you what happened, you need to say, uh, "Really, I'm really sorry." You know, uh, if you need have questions, can you speak to my captain or speak to the person in charge, and let them them deal with that. Now, here's the HIPAA. Um, so, for us in the field, we can uh, share the patient's information with with people who are in the continuity of care. So the firefighter is working with me alongside my treatment of the patient. I can share with them, with my partner. Um, I can share with the nurse and doctor at the hospital, obviously, because they need to know what's going on. Uh, if there's a suspected felony or an assault or something there were, where, a, where a law was broken, uh, we can also share in a limited way with law enforcement. If there's a concern about a, kid, a kidnapped child or some type of... Uh, some kind of felon who's a, 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 a avoiding uh, arrest. If we know about this person, we can actually provide information to law enforcement without uh, uh, causing problems with HIPAA. And this, that's the same with government agencies as well. So a couple other laws that you'll um, encounter. First one's called COBRA. And uh, this has been around about 20, 25 years or so. Uh, originally, it was designed as a way of making sure that everyone had access to health care. I, I believe it was uh, initially targeting women who were pregnant. Um, and But now it's, uh, it's, it's been broadened out to where um, people who lose their job and lose their, uh, their health care from their uh, employer, they're offered COBRA temporarily until they get another job. It's kind of gap insurance between jobs, essentially. Uh, and Tala uh, kind of expanded on COBRA when it comes to the Active uh, Labor Act. So it, it helped provide more care for uh, women who uh, who were going to have babies. Uh, and also, it, it was a part of it was a, called an anti-dumping law. So 
what it uh, kind of said in there was uh, hospitals can't turn people away at the door. They have to accept the patient in. They have to assess them and stabilize them before they can transport them to another hospital. So if you transport a patient to the emergency room and they have no insurance, they have no way of paying, uh, that hospital still has to provide them uh, stabilization and assessment and then have them transported to uh, a county hospital where they can get their the rest of their care. So you have to make sure a lot of times as an EMT, you'll go to a hospital, to an emergency room, to transport a patient from the emergency room to another hospital. And you have to make sure this person is stabilized before you transport them. If you feel this person is, is unstable, their vital signs are grossly out of whack, or you feel like this person could die en route to the hospital, um, during the transport anyway, uh, then you can refuse uh, transport. So federal law says the doctors at the original hospital have to stabilize the patient, uh, do a full assessment on them, and then they'll be transported to another hospital that will accept their insurance or accept their, they're not having any insurance, I guess. Now, there, there is a lot of liability. So when, when it comes to transfer of custody, in the field, um, you go on a call and maybe it's a traffic accident and there's the fire, the fire crews are there and there's multiple patients and multiple cars and you arrive on scene, you and your partner are EMTs in an ambulance and you're there to transport a patient. So you need to go find the person in charge and then you uh, introduce yourself and hi, I'm John, I'm, I'm on BLS 25. What do you got? And then they say, you have patient number two, and they describe the patient, and they give you a turnover, a face-to-face. -face. It's really important that that's done correctly. You listen carefully, and if there's anything missing from their turnover that concerns you, you should ask them and try to clarify. This is kind of a, a high-risk moment in this call, because if not enough information is transferred across, if not enough understanding of what happened, between these, between you and the first responders, you might miss something or you might not treat the patient appropriately or take them to the correct hospital. So when it comes down to uh, this transfer of custody, again, get a full report. Uh, make sure that, that the patient is being transported appropriately by the appropriate level of care. If, you, if you're an EMT and you feel this person is really a, a paramedic level patient, they need paramedic intervention, uh, I would decline respectfully and I would call in a paramedic unit and have them transported uh, that way. Um, know where you're going and your partner will drive to the quickest route possible. Uh, make sure that uh, Make sure that if you are transporting someone who's intoxicated, who's uh, under the influence of drugs, uh, a psych patient, a violent patient, uh, that you have witnesses in, with you in the back of the ambulance, uh, law enforcement in the back of the ambulance as well, if you possibly can, especially if you're going to restrain somebody, they should, you should probably have someone back there with you, uh, another EMT, uh, a family member, police officers, a uh, firefighter, whoever it might be. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the uh, the AED that you you, you learned on with your uh, CPR classes, those actually have tape recorders in them. I guess you could call them data sticks now. And as soon as you open up that lid and hit the green button, and it turns on the machine, uh, it starts to record. And it's 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 locked into that machine, and it's also time and date stamped. And the only one who can access that device is your medical director. So it's a legal document in a court of law. They can extract the data from that data stick. They can, uh, they can produce a transcript of everything that's said on the call. And this is a great protection for us. So if you're in the back of an ambulance by yourself and suddenly the patient starts saying things that are inappropriate, starts threatening you either, uh, either financially, verbally, physically, sexually, uh, if you just reach over and you turn on your AED, just lift up the lid, hit the green button, uh, it starts to record automatically. And it's, again, it's time stamped, it's a legal document, 
and uh, you, you, you don't have to hook the pads up. You don't have to do anything other than turn on the device. It starts to record. Something to think about. We have special situations when it comes to legal stuff. Uh, I'm sure people have heard about organ donors. You look on their driver's license, they have a little pink dot on the driver's license. They're a donor. Um, one thing about organ donors is we don't treat them any differently than people that are that, or that are not identified as organ donors. So if you see someone who's going through the dying process, uh, maybe a motorcycle accident, a young, healthy male or female who's crashed their motorcycle, they got a massive head injury, and you're trying to decide whether to transport them or not, uh, you, and they are an organ donor, you might call the hospital and say, well, we have this person who's an organ donor. They're in cardiac arrest. Would you like us to continue CPR all the way to the hospital so that uh, you could then make them an organ donor? But our treatment doesn't change any other way. Medical insignias, uh, identification. This has kind of changed a bit. Um, they've kind of people have gotten away. I kind of like this. They kind of gotten away from the the typical uh, bracelet or necklace. And they've gone to tattoos now, which I think is pretty cool. So some of the tattoos I was able to find online, but I've seen a couple of these in the field. I kind of like the guy with a DNR on his chest. Unfortunately, that would not be a legal DNR because it's not signed or dated, I guess. Uh, but it's kind of fun. But uh, so don't just look at, at the, you know, don't just look at the wrist or around the neck. And now you're thinking of the forearm and the chest and the back. And I've seen them all different places. So when you're doing your secondary assessment and checking the person head to toe, uh, look for these things. You might see some uh, interesting tattoos that might help you treat the patient. Now, recognizing death in the field, there's, there's two general types of death. Uh, one is called presumptive and the other one is obvious. So let's talk about the presumptive one first. So this is a person, this is a person who's on the ground, they're not responsive to us in any way. Sir, 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 you okay, no response. You cannot feel a pulse, they do not appear to be breathing. So you automatically assume this person might be, might be dead. There's no obvious signs of death, uh, but you can't feel a pulse, so you would, unless they've got a DNR next to them, you would start CPR on them. So there's, they're, they're not decomposing, and they're, they're, there's no rigor mortis, things like that. Now, when it comes to the obvious signs of death, so decapitation, the head's been separated from the body, person has no pulse, there's no reason to start CPR, they're beyond help. Uh, rigor mortis, rigor mortis is the uh, stiffening of the muscles over a period of time after the person dies, their heart stops, their metabolism starts to uh, slow down and stops, and the substances, actin and myosin, they, that allow muscles to relax and, and contract, stop being uh, produced, and over a period of time, the muscles, they stiffen up, they lock up. Um, this starts to happen first in the finer, smaller muscle groups, the fingers and toes, and also in the jaw area as well, which is really good for us because if we arrive on scene and there's someone laying on the ground and they have no pulse and no breathing, and we go to try to open their airway to assess their airway and we can't open their jaw, their jaw is locked, and this would automatically be an obvious sign of death and they have no pulse and their jaw is locked due to rigor mortis, you, you obviously don't have to do CPR. Uh, decomposition, this is when the body starts, the proteins of the body start to break down and the person starts to inflate with gas and they start to decompose. Uh, decomposition takes, you know, hours and hours and hours and you really don't see this for probably till the next day. I go on these calls where someone tries to contact their loved one and they haven't been able to get through uh, by phone and they finally after a day or two they go over to try to get in. The door is locked and they call 911. We get in there and the person's been dead for 
for three or four days, and they've uh, they're quite a bit decomposed and very smelly. Uh, dependent lividity. Uh, I don't know if you can see this picture very well on the screen, but if you notice this gentleman, he's dead, and you notice his arm and his leg is very very purplish in color. And what happens is is when your heart stops or and over a period of time after you die, uh, blood pools down towards gravity. So it pools down towards the earth. So if this person were to be lying flat on his back, blood would pool down to his back and his back would, would be purple. If he were face down uh, on, on the ground, it would pool down uh, and his chest and abdomen and face would all be purple. So it's all dependent upon gravity, essentially. Uh, this is a controversial. Uh, per the county of San Diego, they do not consider this to be an obvious sign of death, but other states and National Registry both do. So you have to go with the flow on this one, I guess. Evisceration of the brain or heart. So this person has no pulse and the brain and or heart are hanging out of the body. Again, obvious signs of death. You don't have to do anything about them. They are automatically uh, unsalvageable. Incineration. This person's crispy critters. They're, they're burnt to a crisp. They have no pulse. You do not have to start CPR on them. Uh, we talked about crime scenes, I think, in the last uh, the last couple of lectures there. Uh, but just just remember that this is uh, this is a legal crime scene, so be careful about touching things. And and again, make sure when you go into the crime scene that the officers are there to to be with and and. If you are concerned about touching something or moving something, just ask them uh, what uh, what to do about it, how to approach it. Um, when I started in the field back in the 80s, early 90s, they were much more uptight about this. So they would actually they they used to give us these uh, paper bags with with uh, little vented holes in them, and any clothing that we cut off the patient, anything we took from the patient. They wanted us to put them in these paper bags. And then those are those are bags. And then they, they take those for evidence. Uh, we don't have those anymore. And, and you know, they, they still recommend try not to cut through the bullet holes and all that. But if you have to, you have to. Uh, other types of situations, uh, this would be some type of... Uh, some kind of felony or some kind of abuse situation. So something like child abuse, elder abuse, uh, or neglect, either one are reportable by law. Any felony, uh, someone gets beat up, stabbed, shot, something like that, even a drug, a drug related injuries, those are all uh, need to be reported. Luckily for us, these are usually these calls are usually, uh, when they're dispatched, they automatically dispatch uh, police with these calls. So usually the cops are already there. So that that uh, that, that requirement to to, uh, to report has already been taken care of. And last but not least, uh, we have these things called baby safe havens. This has been in law for about 10 years or so now in the United States. Uh, and there's a sign on the door of the fire station or the doctor's office or the hospital, and it says that, um, in, at least in the state of California, and this varies from state to state, that a, 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 a woman who's had a, a baby, she can turn that child in within three days of its birth and uh, walk away without any consequences. So you, she, would, she or maybe even the boyfriend or the husband could walk up, knock on the fire department door, they would hand you the baby. Uh, you would uh, then take these little uh, ID bracelets. They're numbered. And you would put a bracelet on the child's ankle. And you would give the corresponding bracelet to the person who turned the child in. So if, if later on, the following week or, or weeks later, if they want to recover that child, they have proof that that child, because the numbers align. Um, that patient then becomes, the child becomes a patient. And they're assessed and transported to the hospital, and then of course eventually they're put into the into the uh, into the, the county 
uh, system and they're adopted over a period of time. Uh, but again, it depends what state you work in. Uh, state of California is three days. Uh, I've heard uh, I've heard uh, longer than that. I've heard shorter than that. Frankly, if I wouldn't really care if someone walked up to the station and handed me a baby and walked away, let them walk. I mean, I'm, I'm more worried about the child than anything else. So then you make that decision yourself, I guess. We're done with uh, chapter three.